All right, John chapter 4. So Muckridge went through the Gospel of John, but he was in chapter 4 a long time ago. I mean, the baseball team in Cleveland were called the Indians back then when he was, when he was there. So I, I, I think maybe some of you didn't even work here when he was in John 4. And I said, that's okay. Um, so I do this week and then next week, and then I'm off for a little while. So I'll start something new uh, when I come back. So John chapter 4, I'm going to read the 30 verses. It's a pretty long passage, uh, but uh, we need to do that to set the context, and then I won't need to refer to a lot of those. John chapter 4, uh, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, <clears throat> he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a well of water swelling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, "Why? what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So one of the great features about the Gospel of John is that we meet people in this book that we do not meet elsewhere in the gospel accounts. Chapter 3, it's Nicodemus. Uh, in chapter 5, it is a paralyzed man by the pool of Bethesda. In chapter 9, it is a man who is born blind. And here in chapter 4, it is the Samaritan woman at the well. This account's familiar. You know this. You've heard it, read it many times. Uh, it likely occurred early in his ministry, 
showing that Jesus is very early about the Father's business. First thing we see in this is a confrontation by a thirsty man. Jesus had to pass through Samaria. If you're a reader of the King James Version, you read he must needs pass through Samaria, which is kind of an interesting way to put it, showing the necessity of doing this. But it was the necessity of geography that he traveled that way. It was the shortest way to get to where he was going. Now, the hostility between the Samaritans and the Jews was epic. They were the descendants of that northern uh, group of tribes that broke away after the, the death of Solomon. And you know the story, I'm sure, if you know your Bible, there was hostility between Jews and Samaritans. And the blood between them was so bad that uh, calling someone a Samaritan was almost like cursing at them. In John 8, 48, the Jews, the Pharisees, dismissed everything that Jesus said by saying, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Apparently, they thought all Samaritans were demon-possessed. And it's this hostility between the Samaritans and the Jews that gives that, par that parable of the Good Samaritan its punch. The last person you would expect to help a Jewish person who had been mugged would be a Samaritan. And now we have Jesus confronting a Samaritan woman. I don't think this is by accident. John is very careful to record a number of interactions between Jesus and different individuals. In John, the first the one we read about is Nicodemus. So here's a man who came to Jesus at night. Nicodemus, a man, a Jew, a member of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee, a scholar, likely a wealthy aristocrat, as were most Pharisees at the time. And he came at night seeking Jesus. In chapter 4, you have a Samaritan. You have a woman. Rabbinical law stated that all Samaritan women were in a perpetual state of uncleanness. They said that Samaritan women were menstrually unclean from birth. And so no man should approach a Samaritan woman or else he would be unclean as well. Here's a woman of questionable reputation. And she met Jesus not at night, but in the middle of the day, as Jesus was seeking her. I just love how, how John shows us that Jesus interacted with all kinds of people. So she sat by the well, he sat by the well at noon as this woman came to draw water. Now, drawing water would have been a communal affair. It would have been done early in the morning or later in the evening. It was cooler. The ladies of the village would probably gather, maybe with their children in tow, uh, going to the well to draw water, pro probably uh, catching up on the news of the day or the gossip of the day. Uh, they had to carry these heavy water jars back home, so you didn't want to do that in the, the heat of the day. And so... The fact that this woman came at noon, the time is not by accident. The, we're not told that this is accidental. She came alone at a time when she knew nobody else would be there. And Jesus took the initiative in this conversation with a very simple request. This is a conversation with a thirsty man. He said, give me a drink. We're told that he was weary. It was noon. And quite likely, he was thirsty. So this woman was, was incredulous. I mean, she says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? She was well aware of the customary norms. Jewish men did not initiate a conversation with a woman, especially a Samaritan woman. But how did she know he was a Jew? 
you know, you said, how is it you a Jew? Was it was it his, his accent? Was it the way he dressed? Perhaps he had a prayer shawl or a, a talent around around him or something. It's kind of interesting. She thought she knew who this was. She thought, how is it that you, a Jew, like you're an ordinary Jewish man? She thought she knew who he was. Which, you know, there's a lot of people who think they know who Jesus is. And unfortunately, some of those people have, they have no clue and they're standing behind pulpits talking about a Jesus that they think they know. And so Jesus began this evangelistic conversation. It's kind of interesting. And he didn't use those canned approaches that we are familiar with. Some of them are, are still popular. I mean, I remember some of them. I was taught these. I used them before when I was, when I was younger. Um, how about this one? Uh, do you know that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? You know what that is? That's the four spiritual laws. You don't hear too much about that, but that was all the rage back in the day. Or how about this one? If you were to die and stand before God, and if he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say to him? That's evangelism explosion. That's how they encourage you to start a gospel conversation. When I was, a, when I was young, I was involved in Youth for Christ, and Abe Lincoln and I would go door to door, <laughs> and we would, we would do a, we would tell people, we are taking a spiritual survey, uh, we're taking a survey of, of religious interest in America. Can I ask you a few questions? We weren't taking a survey. It was a scam. We were just looking for an opportunity to, to give a witness. Um, more recently is the method promoted by Ray Comfort in The Way of the Master. You know, you've seen that, right? Have you ever told a lie? Uh, have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Have you ever lusted? Okay, so now that you have admitted that you're a liar and a blasphemer and an adulterer, of course, you've got to do that with a camera and a microphone in somebody's face. It's the only way you can witness. <laughs> I mean, for those of us who are naturally shy and timid, <laughs> would you stop it? <laughs> Somebody escort this lady out of here. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, some of those approaches are helpful. I mean, they're good conversation starters. I mean, I mean, after all, it's better than no evangelism in some ways. But may I just respectfully say that the way of the master, the way of Jesus, is just to talk to people. Just simply talk to them where they are. And that's what Jesus did. And as this conversation unfolds, uh, you just pay attention to how Jesus talks to this woman, how he deals with her. So this confrontation by this thirsty man, then it promotes a conversation with a thirsty woman. And notice he addresses her curiosity in verses 9 through 15. Notice who's asking all the questions here. It's the woman, verse 9. How is it that you, a Jew, then verse 11, where do you get this living water? Then verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? I mean, he makes a few impactful statements that aroused her curiosity, gave her some things to think about, and he was beginning to show her that though he was the one who asked for a drink, she was the one that had the greater thirst, and she didn't even realize that yet. So he offered her living water in verses 13 and 14. Now, maybe she misunderstood. Maybe she was being overly literalistic. She thought that Jesus would offer her a source of water that would make the long trip from her home to the well obsolete. But living water is a play on words. It can also refer to a spring that is constantly fed 
with fresh water bubbling up from beneath. And maybe that's what she thought. But Jesus is offering something more. I think he might be referring to the prophet Jeremiah. As uh, Jeremiah gives God's indictment to the people, and he says, uh, the Lord says that they have forsaken me, in Jeremiah 2.13, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And Jesus identifies himself with Yahweh of the Old Testament as the fountain of living water. So he's really offering this woman himself, his very indwelling presence through the spirit that would be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So she asks these questions. She's curious. But then he addresses her conscience in verses 16 through 18. Because as is always the case, before you can appreciate the good news, you've got to know what the bad news is. And he, I mean, he could have at this point, she says, sir, give me this water. And he could have right then tried to seal the deal and say, okay, then, you know, bow right now and say the sinner's prayer. I mean, he could have called on her to believe in him. Because, I mean, after all, isn't that what we want? People to believe in Christ? Yeah, but something else has to go on as well. If we are to believe in Christ who saves us from sin... I think we need to know what that sin is that we're saved from. We've got to know what we're being saved from. So to probe her conscience and to measure her determination, Jesus says to her, go call your husband. Now, why would he do this? It's not like he didn't know. Of course he knew. He knew this woman. He knew the situation. But he's probing her conscience to show her that she is the one with the real thirst. That whatever she's thirsting for, she thought it could be have she thought it could be satisfied by having five husbands. And again, we don't know if she was widowed, uh, if she was divorced, or if it's a combination of all of that. Apparently by this time she's given up on marriage. Not a bad idea. But she still needed what she thought her current relationship could provide. So Jesus did not allow this conversation to end. He's pursuing the lost sheep. He knew what she was doing. She was living with a man who is not her husband. It's common today. I mean, nobody thinks about it now. In that day, it was, not a, it was not common. It was considered disgraceful and scandalous to pretend to be married and not be. Of course, we flipped it in our day. I mean, people think that you're insane if you don't live with somebody first before you get married to them. And I could go on a rant about that, but I won't because I don't need to at this point. He knew what she was doing, but he knew what she had done in verse 18. You've had five husbands. You've been married five times before. And there's no details provided, but it does kind of raise a few questions. I mean, what's going on here? Is it likely that this woman had been widowed five times? Um, was, was she just not very smart at choosing a husband? Uh, was she difficult to live with? Can't imagine that. Um, was, was she an adulterer? I mean, there's no indication. But it does sound a little, a little suspicious here. But we see this very clearly, that Jesus knew this woman. He knew her past, and he knew her present. So he begins then to address her confusion in verses 19 through 26. Because then she says, you know, I think that you're a prophet. So let me ask you this question. So instead of talking about me and my situation, let's talk about this theological issue that has been a point of controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans about the right way to worship. Now, it may have been a deflection, 
but Jesus responded to her honestly. Uh, and, and there's some really important truths in there that we don't really have time to look at about worship. Uh, I find it ironic that he failed to speak to the pressing issues of the day. He didn't tell us how many songs we're supposed to sing. Didn't tell us if we're supposed to stand or sit when we sing. Didn't tell us what the lighting should be like or if the fog machine should be up to full blast or whatever. We don't know those things. But in reading the passage, um, notice how Jesus masterfully turns the conversation back to who he is in verses 25 to 26. And so at the end of this conversation, it leads then to a conversion and a thirsty village. She left her water jar. It seems like, what's that little detail there? But it's put there on purpose. The very reason she came was to draw water. And now she leaves it all behind. That's, that, that, that's rather significant. She left it and she ran back into the town to speak to the people she was trying really hard to avoid. So to pick up on Jesus' analogy, she no longer needs her water pot. Her water pot. She discovered the water that would quench her thirst. So now she ran to tell others. It's the consistent record of Scripture that when, when somebody finds Christ, that they are immediately impressed with the desire to share that good news with others. I mean, imagine what she could have said. She could have said, you know, you people have looked down your nose at me. You've treated me like an outcast and as a reject. I have just discovered the key to eternal life, and you all can rot in hell before I share it with you. She could have done that, but she didn't. She ran to those who she was trying to avoid and told them about Christ. And the woman proclaimed Christ to the villagers. Come see a man who told me everything that I did. Can this be the Christ? And so at that, we find out in verse 30, they went out of the town and they were coming to him. So where were they going? Well, they were going to the well because they were thirsty, but not to Jacob's well. They were going to the well of eternal life. They were going to Christ. Christ came and sought this woman. She found him. She knew who he was. She told others. They began to seek him. So let me just give you a few takeaways here from this passage. First of all, Jesus models for us the Great Commission. He goes into all the world to preach the gospel. You know, sometimes in our churches... Um, I, I know because of some of the circles that I'm in, churches that, that attempt to uh, take Scripture seriously, churches that want to emphasize preaching expositionally, verse by verse, sometimes we are accused of, of not being fervent in evangelism. Sometimes we criticize people that are more exuberant than us, but we do sometimes in our churches lack the zeal of those first century Christians. You know, we kind of made our choice. Well, we will choose uh, correct doctrine over evangelistic zeal. It's not an either or. We are commissioned to take the gospel to the world. The way of the master was to pass through Samaria. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons on this passage. I've heard people say, well, you know, Jews in those days would avoid Samaria and would take the long way around to get to where they're going because they don't want to pass through. And the fact that Jesus passed through uh, is really significant. What he did was against custom, they say. But I can't find that that was really the case. I mean, I've looked for that, and I can't find that that was the case. But it's unfortunate that many modern Christians seem to take the long way around Samaria. We tend to, to you know, we try to avoid people who need the gospel because we don't want to become contaminated by them. 
The second, one of the second takeaways is that love and compassion for sinners is not the same as tolerating sin. Jesus did not hedge around the fact that this woman was in a relationship with the man who is not her husband. And yet he had genuine concern for her soul. You see, we can have compassion on people without approving. I mean, listen, we don't have to be mad at people all the time. Sometimes we think that I have to be mad at you to show you that I hate your sin. We don't have to be mad at people. We can have compassion and still uh, acknowledge the fact that, that people need Christ. And thirdly, genuine conversion is evident. I mean, it doesn't say specifically in this text that the woman became a believer, but I think it's pretty obvious. She recognized who Christ was in verse 29. Jesus would later say, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I think she heard the shepherd's voice. She knew his voice. She went and told others about Christ. Come see a man who told me everything I did. She went to these villagers. They knew her reputation. She was not embarrassed to own the one who forgave her. And so effective was her word that it says many of the Samaritans believed because of her word. And I don't know what else to say, how else to say this, but she bubbled. Verse 14, she, Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water will have a spring uh, of water welling up to eternal life. That word welling up is found in Acts 3.8 describes the paralytic man who was healed by Peter and John. And it says that he leaped up, walking and leaping and praising God. She came alone to gather water. She left her water and ran to the village where she overflowed and told people about Christ. When someone comes to Christ, there's life, there's joy, and there's witness. It's all that, you know, I, I, I have to say that I'm really, you know, I mean, don't misunderstand. The skies did not suddenly clear. Um, bluebirds didn't begin to sing all of a sudden. She still had five ex-husbands. She still was currently living with a man that was not her husband. But now she was a follower of Christ, and she had to deal with that situation. She was still known in the village. Her past was not erased. But her sins were forgiven. And her perspective was different. And she was a possessor of eternal life. I'm kind of weary of people who have a profession of faith and yet live in ways that make us wonder if they really know Christ. I've been to too many funerals where people say, I wonder if that person was a Christian. I hope not to have that question asked of me when I'm lying in the casket. I hope nobody will have to, will have to ask that question. So um, let, let me wrap this up. John shows us in his account the very human side of Jesus, the word who is made flesh. John tells us that Jesus wept. John shows us that Jesus ate at a banquet, and here he shows us that he was tired and he was thirsty. Um, interestingly, the very next mention of Jesus being thirsty is when he was on the cross. And it was the next to the last thing that he said before he died. In 1928, it says, knowing that all was now finished, he said, I thirst. It's kind of ironic. Because previously, he had prayed that the cup would pass. And on the cross, he, just, he had just drunk the full cup of God's wrath. And now, he's thirsty. And he's thirsty because he poured out his life for his people. He thirsted so that we may never thirst again. 
he thirsted so that in us there might be this ever-flowing well of water that springs up to eternal life. If you have tasted that the Lord is good, you know this. You, you have found that there is this well in your soul. And it swells up in you. And when it does, it can't help but spill over to others. So I, I almost, I toyed with the idea of titling this sermon, Stay Thirsty, My Friends. <laughs> but I thought it might not be appropriate. But we have the water of life to give to thirsty friends. So let's be careful to do that. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this well of water that flows in us through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who has given us the water that causes us to never thirst again. Help us to share. Help us to overflow to others and to bring others to that well. Pray that we, by our lives, would, would make people thirsty, thirsty for the gospel, and then we can share it with them and see others come to Christ. That's our prayer. It's our desire. We pray this for the sake of Christ. Amen.